Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll get started. Um, good morning and uh, welcome to the fifth meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019. Uh, I would remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones as they interfere with the electronics. Uh, we have apologies from the convener, James Doran, so uh, I will be there for convening today's meeting. Agenda item one is a decision to take uh, business in private, um, and that's to take agenda item three in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Okay, thank you. Agenda item two is consideration of the annual report and accounts 2017-18 of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland. And I would welcome uh, Bill Thompson, <coughs> Ethical Standards Commissioner. Welcome, Bill. And the Commissioner is joined by Ian Bruce, who is the Public Appointments Manager. <coughs> Welcome, Ian. Uh, I would invite the Commissioner to make some brief opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so um, as I approach the end of my five-year term of office next month. Um, as you've mentioned, I'm accompanied by Ian Bruce, the Public Appointments Manager, in case you wish to ask any detailed questions on the uh, public appointments part of my work, which I appreciate is not obviously within your remit. Um, but I am here to answer any questions you may have on the annual report for the year to the 31st of March 2018. Um, with your indulgence, this may take me a minute or so, um, I thought it might be helpful to set out how my post came into being and provide a little bit more detail than is in the briefing paper for the committee. So the post was, in effect, created in stages. It was created by this parliament, as some of you will know from your uh, period of office here. The chief investigating officer was the first post to be created. That was created in 2000 by the Ethical Standards in Public Life, etc., Scotland Act, um, under which I still operate. That act also established the Standards Commission, to whom I report uh, if I'm dealing with... Um, complaints against councillors or members of public bodies. Um, the second role was the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner role, and that was created in 2002 by the Scottish Parliamentary Standards Commissioner Act, uh, and that is the act under which I investigate complaints about um, MSPs. The third element of it was the Public Appointments Commissioner, um, and that was brought into being by the Public Appointments and Public Bodies, etc., Scotland Act 2003. So those three strands have been brought together, but in two different stages. Um, first, between 2009 and 2011, the roles of the Chief Investigating Officer and the Standards Commissioner were held by the same individual, uh, and that was until April 2011, <coughs> when they were merged to create the post of Public Standards Commissioner, and that was done by an Act of 2010, the Scottish Parliamentary Commissions and Commissioners Act. That Act also created a new Ethical Standards Commission, which had two members. One of them was the Public Standards Commissioner, the other the Public Appointments Commissioner. That lasted for two years, and then in 2013, uh, by an order under the Public Services Reform Act of 2010, um, the Commission and the two Commissioner posts were abolished, uh, and my current post was created, uh, and then additional responsibilities were added last year uh, by the Lobbying Scotland Act 2016. So there are quite a few strands that come together uh, in the role. Uh, the annual report obviously covers all of these aspects of the functions, and as I say, I will deal with any questions you have on them. I'd like to restrict the remainder of my opening remarks to the one aspect of my role, uh, the investigation of complaints about councillors. Um, and in addition to commenting on the figures which you have before you in the <coughs> annual report, um, I now have figures for the period from April 2018 to the end of the year, i.e. to December 2018. Um, and I think these are interesting in a few respects. The first is that the reduction in complaint numbers in the year to March 2018 has been reversed, quite significantly actually. Um, 
And this looks to be a repeat of a pattern we've noticed before, where there, are, there is a reduced number of complaints in the year following an election. Uh, and we've now, as it were, rebounded to something closer to the norm. And in the nine months to December 2018, we received 150 complaints uh, which we're dealing with or had dealt with as 100 cases. And if that rate was to continue throughout the full year to the end of March, uh, the total would exceed the numbers we've received in all previous years except 2015-16. So it, it has significantly uh, gone back up again. Um, as in previous years, the main categories of complaint um, in the reporting year and in the part year to December have been, there are four of them, failure to register or declare an interest, which I'm treating as one category. The second is misconduct and individual applications, and that involves quite a range of things which I can discuss with you if you're interested. Um, lobbying, not under the Lobbying Act, but lobbying in the sense of how councillors have dealt with issues brought to them by constituents, or in some cases have not dealt with them. And the fourth uh, aspect is disrespect. Um, I once said to this committee that I thought we had seen the final blossoming, those were my words, um, of disrespect complaints. And that was in December 2017, and I regret that I was wrong. Almost one third of the complaints uh, received have alleged a failure to respect councillors or members of the public and employees. In total, that's 46 out of the 150 received this year. Sorry, in the year to December 2019. Social media featured in approximately 40% of the disrespect complaints and for that matter in some of the others in different categories. Um, an equal percentage, and I was slightly surprised by this, related to conduct in public meetings, including council meetings, so council meetings and other public meetings attended by councillors. Um, the remainder involved comments made in the press or simply direct communication, in other words, engagement one-to-one -one with the person who complained. And as in previous years, a roughly similar number of complaints concerned failure to register or declare an interest and misconduct on individual applications. A quarter of those also involved allegations of disrespect or misrepresentation. Others involved allegations of bias, undue influence and conspiracy or failure to withdraw after declaring an interest. Um, this committee and its predecessor have asked about the definition of disrespect, which I think is quite an important issue. Um, it is still has been and, and remains a difficult question to answer because of the importance uh, for any assessment of it of the context and the relevance of Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, if you wish, I'm happy to go into that in more detail uh, in the course of the meeting. Over the years that I have been coming before this committee, questions have been posed about the scope for revision of the councillor's code, uh, and I have actually given oral evidence on that and made written submissions to the previous committee. Um, some changes were made last year, as you may be aware, primarily to incorporate a specific statement to the effect that bullying or harassment um, is completely unacceptable and will be considered to be a breach of the code. My understanding that is that uh, civil servants have now made submissions to ministers seeking views on whether this is the time to conduct a full review of the councillor's code and of the model code for public bodies. Um, I'm not aware of any response from ministers, uh, but it is possible that that may come within this committee's remit uh, in the reasonably near future. <coughs> if reviews are undertaken, uh, that may obviously be an early opportunity for my successor to make a contribution. Caroline Anderson's appointment was confirmed last month by the Parliament. It will be effective from the 1st of April, and I'm sure that this committee will wish to engage with her in due course and afford her the same courtesy. Um, with your permission, I would like to finish by recording my appreciation of the efforts of the staff in my office. Commissioners come and go, as you can see. 
But those who support us uh, just keep on doing so. They keep the show on the road. They do so accurately and with remarkable good humour. I would like to say that the quality of the advice and support which I have received, not least from the man sitting on my right, has been second to none. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, move, we'll move to questions. We'll start off with Graham. Thanks, convener. Um, uh, good morning, Mr. Thompson. Um, the previous two years, I feel I've probably given you a bit of a hard time uh, in opening questions, uh, but uh, I'm going to go a bit easier on you because you are retiring, and uh, I don't think any of this is your fault. You have uh, a job to do, um, and 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 and, you, and you've done it. I think if uh, any of us have uh, complaints about uh, the position, it's not personal. Um, so I do wish you well in the future. Um, you've raised a, a number of uh, very interesting points in your opening remarks. Um, you say that, uh, that, that, that there was a reduction uh, in complaints uh, following an election, and, that, and then it's gone back up. So maybe, maybe we can start on that uh, and ask you why, why you feel that is. Um, I mean, you mentioned various categories of complaints. What, what do you think is going on there? I, this is pure speculation on my part, um, but I think it's probably useful for me to indicate why I think it should be. Um, there's a settling in period after an election, at which you will all be more uh, accustomed to than I am. Um, and I don't think that just applies to the people who are elected. Um, I think it also applies to the electorate who are, if you like, um, waiting to see how the newly elected body performs. So it, it, it seems to me that there, is, there isn't a complete gap, but certain types of complaint haven't had time to arise. So, for example, misconduct in individual applications. Um, newly elected councillors won't for several weeks have been involved in dealing with applications, far less got into a position where people think, oh, he or she had this predetermined position and therefore um, they've behaved wrongly. Um, as I've been asked uh, in previous evidence sessions, a number of the complaints are politically motivated. There is no doubt about that at all. Um, and if there is a sort of settling in period, um, perhaps people are, if you like, sizing each other up or waiting to see what happens before they start down that road. Um, and as has also been mentioned, and I know this is a, an annoyance for many elected members, um, if a member from one party makes what is apparently a politically motivated complaint about a member of another party, almost as sure as night follows day, there will be a reciprocal complaint at some later stage, uh, and it may be that newly elected members are not keen to rush into that. Yeah, um, I, th I think you're right. Um, I mean, a number of complaints are politically motivated, even if they're not directly from uh, a councillor or, or, or an MSP. You can get somebody else to do the complaining. Um, is, do, do you think in, in this review that civil servants have asked for, if that was to ever take place, that, that we, we should be able to sort of weed out politically motivated complaints? Convener, I've, I've thought quite a lot about this. Um, I did at one point uh, come to the previous committee with a list of grounds on which um, I might prioritise complaints. That was at a time around 2015-16 when the number, the volume was increasing almost exponentially, and I thought we just wouldn't be able to handle them all. Um, and so one of the things I thought about putting on the list was where complaints are obviously politically motivated. Um, and I have been questioned at this committee in the past about vexatious complaints, which is a similar sort of issue. Um, the difficulty with it is um, a vexatious complaint requires two things. I appreciate that's not specifically the question. Um, one is that it's designed to annoy, that, that's its primary purpose. Um, the other is that it has no 
proper substance, no foundation. Um, and I think the same thing applies with politically motivated complaints. If there is no foundation, then it should not proceed and it, it shouldn't, resources shouldn't be wasted on it. Um, where it becomes more difficult is where there is actually uh, some foundation, some basis for it, uh, and there may be a substance to the complaint. Um, my attitude has been, and the committee may disagree, um, that in that context, the motivation of the complainer is irrelevant. Um, and I've also tried to take this forward. Um, if there's been, or there appears that there might have been a breach of whatever the code is, um, is it right to ignore it just because it's politically motivated? Um, and it has been put to me in the past that um, there may be circumstances where everybody around whatever table it is has engaged in the particular thing which has given rise to this complaint, and therefore, you know, why should they complain about each other? Um, but if you follow that through, it leads to the awkward conclusion that some types of breaches of the code, or potential breaches of the code, are not important, whereas others are. And I think that's quite difficult for somebody in my position to make a judgment on and therefore decide not to pursue. So, uh, sorry, this is a long-winded way of coming back to the question. Um, if politically motivated complaints are to be eliminated, that would have to be done in the councillor's code by you as the body um, setting it up, um, because I, I don't think anybody in my position could make that judgment. But you can have a view on it. My view is that if there is a basis for the complaint, in other words, if it appears that there's been a breach of the code, then it ought to be investigated, even if the motivation for making it is, even if it's purely political. OK, fair enough. Now, we've, we've talked, uh, you mentioned, we've talked previously about uh, complaints of disrespect mm -hmm. and... You know how hard that is to uh, establish, and uh, sometimes it depends on how thick a, how thick a skin you've got, whether you know whether whether you feel you've been disrespected. Um, this this must get, take up an, an enormous amount of your your time uh, and resources. I mean, is that is that an area that we should be looking at? You're right. It does take up a lot of time and resource. Um, and certainly in my shoes, I have found some of the judgments quite difficult to make, some of the decisions difficult to make. Um, I have, um, if it helps at all, um, gone through the disrespect complaints which have been referred to the Standards Commission. Um, and those which have been found to be a breach have almost always involved um, the following sets of words. So these are the things which the Standards Commission, to whom I report, treat as serious enough disrespect to involve a breach of the code. Um, personal attack, affecting the rights and reputation of whoever the individual is. Um, statements or comments which are intended to impugn and demean. And comments which are gratuitous, offensive and abusive. And the word which the Commission used finally is egregious. Um, I was at a school which had a Latin, Latin motto, um, so I know what egregious means because that was part of it. Um, anyway, um, these are in the context of Article 10, which I mentioned, Article 10 of the EC, the European Convention of, on Human Rights, um, which of course grants everybody uh, a right of freedom of speech. And as you will be well aware, those who, politicians and those who engage in commentary on politics have an enhanced right of freedom of speech. So when disrespect is alleged by a councillor, or for that matter by an MSP, um, it has to be assessed again this, against this kind of higher standard. Um, I do have examples, um, w which I can give you if you wish, but but they don't take you anywhere because they're simply based on the um, particular circumstances. I, I was um, I was once lied about in a in a local newspaper, and I I, I spoke to a lawyer uh, about it, and he said 
As I was thinking of complaining, it's not something I'm really ever do. And he said, well, there's no point complaining because um, you can't uh, besmirch the reputation of a politician. You've just got to take it on the chin. That's what he said. I thought, well, okay. So do you think politicians need to toughen up a bit? Well, that's a general statement which I'm not in a position to make. Um, some of the stuff I've quoted is based on the jurisprudence of the European Court. Um, and they have said that uh, along with the enhanced protection for what's called political expression, uh, there is, on the other hand, an expectation that those who put themselves forward for election and engage in politics um, should expect to have uh, thicker skins. Uh, and be open to levels of, frankly, abuse, which the general public shouldn't expect to have to deal with. Um, there are, there's an interesting distinction drawn in the court cases between statements of fact and value judgments um, and some accusations of lying um, may be based on what is clearly uh, an attempted statement of fact. Uh, in those circumstances, uh, the protection of the court or under the code is only available if there is some reasonable basis for the alleged statement of fact. Um, they are much more lenient if the accusation is made by way of a value judgment. Uh, in those cases, there only has to be some they don't use the word flimsy, but, but some flimsy basis for, for making the, the allegation. Um, and that, that's another complication. Just one more question from me, because I know others will want to jump in. But have you seen over, your, over the course of your uh, tenure uh, an improvement in, in behaviour? Um, or not? I'm going to duck that because I don't oh, observe don't behaviour as such. I only deal with the complaints about uh, allegedly poor behaviour. I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that question. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask in terms of resources, but focus this a bit, and what, when, when what can they support and training happens in councils for councillors? There was quite a number of new councillors elected right across Scotland the last time round. And... Have you seen any correlation between councils are finding times very tough uh, and increasingly council officials will be saying, sorry, no can do. Councillors are having to then go back to constituents and, and, and say can't do. Um, does that lead to greater tension, tensions between the constituents and the councillors, but also between the councillors and the council officials that, that one could interpret as being disrespectful in terms of councillors fighting their corner. So, so two questions there. One, in terms of what support and, and training for councillors is happening out there. And two, the pressures that are on councils, does that lead to, to difficulties? Um, I think starting with the second one, and although I don't have evidence for this, um, I think most of us would expect that uh, increased pressure will lead, will lead to tension. Um, the more difficult the situation is, the more likely it is in terms of human behaviour that, that tensions will arise. Um, but I think the complaints that come to me are more down to um, individuals rather than the, 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 the overall uh, picture. And, and back to your first question, um, there's an obligation under the code for councils to support councillors, um, and I know that training is made available, particularly for new councillors. In some council areas, there's follow-up training. It varies across the country. Um, those councillors who receive the most severe sanction at public hearings are those who have either um, not bothered to attend the training or, in one case, have deliberately um, ignored the code. Um, and generally, <laughs> I think the most extreme examples which I have seen um, have been in part down to the personalities involved. Um, and 
I think what there has been, by way of a growing tendency, um, is less obvious party discipline. I worked in local government in the 70s. Um, if there was an issue with Councillor X's performance, you went to Councillor X's group leader, whoever it was, um, and you had a discussion and it was dealt with. It's as simple as that, um, apart from the odd renegade. Um, that is... That applies to fewer councillors now in terms of the overall percentage. Um, and there are undoubtedly um, minority councillors, independent councillors are from small groups who feel very strongly about a particular topic um, or particular issue um, and they may be prepared to flout the rules um, in order to make their point. And in some ways I have sympathy with them but the, the difficulty is the rules are there. Uh, and if they breach them and there's a complaint, I simply have to investigate and report. I don't know if that answers your question. It's my best. I think so, but I think, I think I think it would be that point about should there be, you know, some kind of, for example, when when the local public services ombudsman was in, they they talked to us about the the, the level of work they were doing with councils on the complaints procedure. Uh, because the more effective that complaints procedure was, the less likelihood <coughs> of, of complaints reaching the ombudsman. And it's whether whether there should be a, a, a stronger relationship between yourselves and the officer uh, leadership within councils to try and do more to ensure that there is decent quality information and training for councillors around this whole area, given, given the pressures, I believe, that are on councillors. It's a fair point, convener. Um, there is contact. Um, I, I'm not allowed to give advice, so I, I, I try not to. Um, but the Standards Commission itself does, and the Standards Commission, to whom I report, um, they do two things. They organise um, training generally on a regional basis, rather than although sometimes they're council-specific. Um, and they also arrange, once or twice a year, um, meetings for monitoring officers who tend to be the key people in terms of advising on the code. Um, and I actually get involved in these. I tend to, just to hear what's being said and to engage with, with people. Um, so there's a fair amount of support there. I think my final observation on it would be, um, I, I don't disagree with what the Ombudsman is saying, but in terms of looking at what happens in life, um, it's not the managed things that go wrong. It's circumstances where, for one reason or another, it may be somebody's personality, it may be a sequence of events on a particular day, um, something goes wrong. Uh, and, and occasionally it's done deliberately, more often than not, I think it's probably in the heat of the moment. Thank you. Alexander? Thank you, Kinrina. There's been quite a lot of publicity and there's been many campaigns of late with reference to harassment. Uh, and there also has been quite specific ones related to sexual harassment. Can I ask, have you seen any change uh, in the number of complaints that are coming forward in relation to sexual harassment, or uh, has that not been your case so far this year? Um, Convener, I have not as yet received any complaint specifically about sexual harassment. Um, a year or so ago, um, I dealt with a complaint which involved a male councillor and a relatively junior female member of staff who was, she felt harassed by the attention that the councillor was paying to her. Um, there was no allegation of any sexual motive. Um, I have um, more recently dealt with, um, it went to a hearing, um, a case in which there was inappropriate physical contact between a male councillor and four women, two of whom were councillors and two of whom were members of staff. Um, again, in that case, there was no allegation that it was sexual. Um, in my opinion, it was sexist, but it, it, there was no allegation of sexual harassment. Um, if the case is serious enough, it's more likely to be reported to the police than to come to me. And do you think the code of conduct is clear enough on 
how that, or do you think there's any new guidelines or any new views that should be put into that in the current climate? Um, I think the code of conduct is crystal clear, um, and I'm not sure how much more you could do by way of improving on that, because as soon as you start to give examples. Um, you may leave some things out, um, or you end up with a ridiculously long list, uh, which isn't particularly helpful. Um, in terms of guidance, um, I don't mean this to be flippant, I think just being alive um, should allow people to understand what is acceptable and, and, and what isn't. Um, I we can all learn. Uh, I don't mean to be facetious. Um, yes, it's true. There appear to be some councillors whose social attitudes are different from the current um, general approach. But I don't think the code will make much difference to that. And by the way, just to come back to one of the things that the convener asked me about, um, at the last meeting with monitoring officers which I attended, it was very clear from those who spoke, um, that they find the code helpful in guiding members who come to them for advice. And I think that is the case. The code is, the code is there to try and support uh, individuals under that situation. You also talked about, in your opening remarks, about 40% of complaints being social media related in some way. Uh, I mean, obviously, with the private and professional side of people's social media, uh, is, there, is, there an, is there an element there that needs to be looked at uh, as to what content should be? Because obviously if they are, if they are merging or, they are, or they are, uh, the, the lines are, and the boundaries are becoming quite unclear there, uh, is that what's creating the issue to have the number of 40%? Uh, because that's quite a high uh, a number I would expect. Just to be clear, Convener, what I meant to say was 40% of the disrespect cases um, ah. involved social media. Um, some of the other cases do as well. Um, Technically, if a councillor says something disrespectful on their personal social media, it's not a breach of the code. Um, but if they're identifiable as a councillor, or if they do it in circumstances where they appear to be holding themselves out as a councillor, for example, commenting on something that happened at a council meeting they were attending, um, then I, I don't think they can avoid the uh, obligations under the code. And I think um, the general attitude amongst people involved in, in regulating these things is that it's becoming very difficult to draw a distinction between what you as NSPs or what uh, as councillors, as, as many of you have been, um, might have done in your private lives and what you do. Um, I think the Committee on Standards in England, who published a report on ethical standards in local government just 21st of January, I think, um, they actually come out and say there should not be any distinction between what councillors do on social media in their private lives and what they do in their public uh, persona. Um, I mean, that will be a matter for you and other politicians to determine, but I think that's the way things are moving. On to the social media <laughs> just, just in a minute. Before we leave Thanks. this sort of line of questioning around sexual harassment, I mean, within the Scottish Parliament, there is, <coughs> there is now training being set up diversity training for, for all MSPs, for, for members of staff. Um, and is that not something that you think would equally be useful in, in terms of local government? Because it's not just about what's appropriate and inappropriate when it comes to, to sexual harassment. It's about what's generally appropriate and inappropriate in terms of the way that, that we treat each other. Um, is that not something, again, that, that councillors could could gain from? Yes, I agree. Um, maybe not all, but yes, councillors generally, I'm sure, could. And despite what I may have said earlier, I'm not disagreeing with the suggestion that people, including councillors, would benefit from training. Thank you. Hey, Annabelle. Hey, thank you. Good morning, uh, uh, gentlemen. Um, so we anticipate at some point uh, a new planning a piece of planning legislation um, to be enacted. Um, obviously, this committee has done a lot of work uh, on the original draft of the, the bill, and we wait to see what the ultimate product will look like. Um, 
because, of course, there have been significant amendments. But presumably you've been watching this uh, to an extent. And I just wonder if you had any particular expectations uh, uh, about the potential impact of the legislation that will be in place at some point on uh, perhaps the, the number of complaints in this area, because it seems that uh, in terms of the, the figures we already had, that uh, issues regarding planning were already quite high up there in terms of number of complaints, and that indeed seems to be to continue to be the case in terms of the update that you helpfully gave us in your opening statement. Uh, I'm not sure that changes to the law will make much difference to the fact that planning is still the biggest single source of complaints. Um, and I have been asked in the past about spurious complaints, and this is probably the area in which to test that, um, because quite a lot of the complaints which occur in relation to uh, failure to declare an interest, in fact, almost all of them relate to planning cases. Uh, in some cases, failing to register an interest may be relevant. Um, some of the cases to do with disrespect have arisen from what has been said by a councillor at a planning meeting. Um, some of the other allegations of uh, conspiracy, um, bias, most of these probably relate to planning decisions because they matter to people. Um, we've even had cases of councillors seeking to influence decisions on their own planning applications. So, you know, they, they, they do generate quite a lot of business, and um, I hope this is not seen as a way of uh, uh, avoiding the question. I think changing the law won't remove these tensions and frustrations that people feel, and which, which lead them, I think, to examining carefully what's been said, what's been done, uh, and looking to see whether, if they can't appeal under the planning system, they can find another way of um, trying to um, undermine the, well, I think some of them probably expect they can undermine the decision. They can't by complaining to me, but they might well undermine the people who made the decision. Yes, I mean, obviously, it's 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 uh, it's very difficult to to uh, determine at this stage if there will be any positive impacts. I mean, you mentioned there the issue of the uh, failure failure to disclose, to declare uh, a registered interest or indeed failure to register. And I just wonder, picking up on the convener's point, I mean, presumably that's not, you know, heat of the moment, public meetings where passions run high on particular planning applications. That's, you know, cold, you know, in the light of the day uh, requirements. And I just wonder, you know, given that this is a perennial problem, I mean, what action are councils taking to to try to encourage uh, councillors to, to 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 abide by the requirements set down. I mean, certainly our experience here in this parliament is that it's very clear what the requirements are, and that there's no hesitation on the part of the parliamentary bodies reminding you what the requirements are. I just wonder what happens at the local authority level. I, I don't have a comprehensive picture of what happens. I, I, advice is given, um, and in some cases um, we end up with disputes between the councillor and the advisers as to what was said. Mm -hmm. um, and that, these are quite difficult cases, obviously. Um, I think there's a distinction between registration and declaration. Um, registration, I agree with what's behind your question, registration should be pretty straightforward. I mean, I've been involved in this in the Parliament as well. There are, there are difficult cases, but it, it is relatively straightforward. Um, where members have not registered, um, I don't think I've come in across any cases where, even after a hearing, it's been clear that it was done deliberately. It tends to be, um, if you like, inadvertence. For example, they may have shares in or have been appointed a director in a dormant company. Um, various people have fallen into that trap. Um, declaration is more difficult and more nuanced because then the question is, um, if you have registered your interest, are they properly relevant to, are they so significant that you ought to have declared them? Um, and views can vary quite significantly on that. And that is where I don't think changing the law will make any difference because there will still be room for differences of opinion. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the censure aspect, so what, what would be the censure for... for 
in cases where a breach of that particular requirement is, is established, what kind of censure would there be? Because I would have thought the censure might encourage others to reflect a bit harder on, on yeah. the issue. Um, sorry, just before I come to that, um, it occurred to me to mention that the Committee on Standards uh, in England, in the report which I referred to earlier, have suggested the adoption within the English codes, and each authority drafts its own, um, the adoption of the objective test which is set out in the Scottish Councillor's Code. Uh, they see that as a, as a step forward from where things are at the moment. Um, in terms of censure, um, trying to influence your own planning application tends to attract uh, suspension. Um, failure to register um, or, or having forgotten about something and failure to declare something which is, for example, dormant, I, I think will... T I don't impose the sanctions, but they're, they're imposed by the Standards Commission. Um, I don't recollect any member being any more severely dealt with than censured for those type of uh, breaches of the code. Um, I think if it was blatant, um, th th there would be a different position. Um, I, I, I'm clear that the Standards Commission regard failure to register or failure to declare as a serious breach of the code because transparency of in terms of people's interests is, is vital. Um, I'm sorry, I'm racking my uh, rather cumbersome brain for circumstances where a councillor may have been suspended for failure to declare, and I, I can't at the moment remember any. I may be wrong, convener. I'm sorry if I've got oh, that wrong. Fine. Perhaps yeah. it's just supplemental information yeah. to provide to the, the committee. Uh, so I, I think it's a question of uh, over time watching what the trend is with regard to those particular breaches, uh, which may suggest that further action can be carried out to try to guide councillors as to you know, the, the safest and most prudent way forward for them. Um, turning to the issue of the, the GDPR, I just wonder, are you seeing any particular impact uh, as a result of the, the General Data Protection Regulation being in place? Uh, and if not yet, do you anticipate that that may lead to more complaints coming forward? I, I do get complaints which make reference, convener, to um, GDPR issues. Um, I refer those aspects of the complaints to the Information Commissioner's Office because it's not my remit. Um, it has had an effect on the way we do things in the office. Um, I no longer publish um, decisions with names because that's not appropriate anymore. Um, it won't affect my successor's workload because it's outside the remit, but yes, more complaints are coming in uh, referring to these um, issues. I ask it with regard to your process. Um, I noted that indeed you have anonymised uh, decision summaries, I think now, <coughs> excuse me, on your website. What is, sorry, I haven't had a chance to, to look that up. So what does that mean that even the name of the councillor is, is not part of the The councillor will not be disclosed. Will not be disclosed. No. Um, I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm not wholly sure quite how far I have to go in anonymising. Um, my current thinking is that naming the council area isn't in itself sufficient to allow the councillor to be identified, but it may, on, depending on the circumstances, it may be sufficient, and I'll need to be very careful about that. So you get to the point where the amount of information you can give is so little that it's not particularly helpful to people. Having said that, back to a previous question you asked about censure, um, the word does go round. You will know this. Um, I sometimes find if I end up back in an area where I've been fairly recently, people will say to me, oh, we know what happened to so-and-so. So, -and -so. so um, yeah, it, it does go around. Localised, yeah, very, for those in the know and yes. the same milieu, perhaps, it seems a bit strange that, um, you know, one piece of legislation is actually making things less transparent in another area, because I would have thought the public interest uh, would... Uh, merit, um, you know, further transparency in regard to at least, you know, I understand about perhaps names of other uh, people involved in the particular circumstances, but the actual counsellor against whom the the, 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 the inquiry is, is, mm -hmm. is proceeded against and if, if there is a breach established against whom censure is taken, I mean, I find it very strange that that is not part of the well, public. 
to me. So, Kavira, um, I'll try not to make this complicated. Uh, the decision summaries that I used to put up um, related to cases where there was a breach and some cases where there was no breach. Councillors who have been found not to be in breach, I think, probably understandably object to their name coming up on Google when they were when they didn't when they weren't in breach of the code. So, um, for those where there what happens now is that I do not put up decisions uh, of that nature. Uh, if there's a public hearing, the Standards Commission, who have this specific statutory right to do this, they publish the decision, and as of now, anyway, they, they name the councillor or councillors involved. Um, they also, and this is relatively recent, they issue press releases in advance of the public hearing taking place, um, and they will issue a press release with the outcome. So there is publicity given, not by me, but by the Standards Commission, to those cases which go through to a public hearing and result in a, a finding. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Graham, you wanted to come in? Yeah, um, I mean, just to be clear on that, um, if so any, any councillor who, who is found in breach of the code would have to go to a public hearing? Um, section 16 of the Act gives the Standards Commission three options. Um, one is to send the report back to me for further investigation. Thankfully, that hasn't yet happened, but it, it could do. Um, the second is to hold a public hearing, which is what happens in 90-something percent of cases. The third option is to do nothing. Uh, and that has only happened once in, in my term of office. Right. So, essentially, any, anyone who's found in breach of the code, in breach of the code, by, will, by you, would be named somewhere. Yes, they will. Um, right. And at the public hearing, one of the, well, there's two options available to the commission. One is to agree with me that there's been a breach. The other is to disagree with me and say there has been no breach, and that, that does happen. Yeah. It, it's not by any means a foregone conclusion. Thanks, Andy. Uh, thanks very much. Um, just a few sort of follow-up questions. Returning to the question of sexual harassment, I think if I'm right, you said you'd had no complaints. Correct. Does that not surprise you, given that there's been quite extensive um, concern expressed in the media by councillors like Julie McKenzie in Argyll and Butte, Rosa Zambonini in North Lanarkshire and others who have documented extensive complaints of that uh, and describe a toxic culture in parts of local government. Um, so I'm surprised that you've had no complaints. Um, there are a number of factors involved. Um, one is the simple question of conduct. Um, another is the impact of the conduct and I don't underestimate the amount of courage it takes to put forward a complaint. So, in that sense, I'm not wholly surprised. Um, I've outside the remit of this committee, but I, you know, I have had to investigate allegations. Um, it's not easy for the people involved. Yeah, no, no, I understand that, and there are issues around the complaints procedure within councils um, of this nature as well. I, I understand that. But it, it would be somewhat surprising, wouldn't it, given the evidence we have, if there were not to be some complaints uh, made to the Ethical Standards Commissioner in relationship to the behaviour of councillors where they are involved? Well, I think you're asking me a slightly awkward question. No, I'm, no I appreciate that. I, not... I'm not minded to suggest that councillors are engaging in sexual harassment. I have no evidence of that. So I have no basis for making that suggestion. And that then leads me to the question of whether I'm surprised or not. Um, if I have no evidence, that's all I can answer on. OK, that's, that, that, that's fair enough. Um, do you have any um, information or evidence about how satisfied complainers are with your 
investigations. Obviously, when they go to the Standards Commission, there's a there's a sanction, and people will take a view as to whether they feel that's appropriate or not. Um, but do do people ever complain that you haven't investigated something properly? Yes, they do. Um, if they complain that it hasn't been investigated properly, um, I invite them to, or I offer to pass their complaint on to the Ombudsman, the, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. And over the years, once or twice a year, um, that has happened. Um, as of now, this could change tomorrow, um, the Ombudsman has not yet found that there was a failure to investigate properly. Um, I record the amount of what we call post-decision correspondence. Nobody has yet written to me and said, what a wonderful job you did. <laughs> it tends to be the opposite. Um, now, when I started, um, that was, or started looking at it, it was 20 odd percent of cases led to um, post-decision correspondence. That is now down at around 11%. I appreciate that could change. Um, it suggests to me that at the very least, uh, we're doing a better job of explaining the reasons for the decision. But I accept that there will always be a percentage of people who are dissatisfied um, with the outcome if they have complained and if the outcome has been that there is not a breach. Um, others are dissatisfied simply because it's outside my remit and when I explain that, they, they're, they're annoyed about that and I appreciate that. But there's nothing I can do about the, the, the remit in the short term anyway. Um, I set out in my strategic plan to assess satisfaction levels. Um, I have held off doing so until we have a properly functioning website um, which will allow us to do that. Um, and we have, in the course of this year, um, been revamping the website. The new one goes live on the 18th of February, at which point um, we will be able to do this in a, in a more satisfactory way. I, I think it's a gap at the moment that we haven't tried to assess that and find out why people are dissatisfied. Um, some will be obvious just because it was the wrong decision from their point of view. Um, but if there are things we can do to improve how we handle complaints, we need to know and, and improve. OK, that's uh, very helpful. Um, I should declare an interest as a member of the corporate body who provide your resources and also sat on the panel that interviewed your successor, uh, Caroline Anderson, who was appointed by Parliament last week. Um, would you like to put on the record um, in public uh, any advice you'd have to Caroline about the role that you uh, are responsible for and how you discharge your responsibilities? Convener, I think that's an opportunity which I would prefer to decline. Um, I have already met with Caroline Anderson. I expect to meet with her reasonably frequently between now uh, and when she takes up, well, I, I leave and she takes up the post. Um, I'm doing my best to make sure that <coughs> she is well informed and uh, introduced to as many people with whom she will be engaging uh, as possible. So I'll put that another way. What do you feel are the key challenges facing your successor? Um, in terms of Complaints against councillors. The challenge always is to find the right balance between investigating thoroughly and doing so as quickly as possible. There's an inevitable tension there. Um, obviously, anybody in my shoes would like to make the right decision um, in terms of whether there's been a breach or there hasn't. Um, that is a challenge at times. Um, and the complexities of some of the issues um, create their own challenge. Um, dealing with MSP cases, um, not always, but generally the profile is a bit higher, which um, I think also puts further pressure on the time scale. Um, I'm conscious that the Standards Procedures Public Appointments Committee is going to be considering the Joint Working Party report on sexual harassment at the Parliament. Um, 
that may lead to changes to the code and to procedures. Um, I think there's a possibility that that may have implications for other aspects of the role which are not governed by the same code. But if the procedure changes in one area, it strikes me as reasonably obvious that there are implications for other areas and they'll need, they'll need to be handled carefully. Um, in terms of the public appointments side, um, I think there are two challenges. Um, the most obvious one, and it comes back to something the convener asked about in terms of local government, is simply the pressure on resources. Um, there are more and more public appointments coming through. Um, there is no more resources to deal with them. We have identified ways of improving the process. We've discussed these and agreed them with uh, people in the government who, who are involved in it. Uh, but having the resource actually to do that is... Uh, protecting that resource is quite challenging. Um, and the other thing is um, trying to avoid a growth in what we call dual scrutiny, um, which is circumstances where the minister making an appointment has to put the preferred candidate to a parliamentary committee for approval. Um, there are some risks involved in that. Um, it's not for the remit of this committee, but it, it is a challenge potentially. Okay, thank you. Um, Alexander? Can I go back to have some discussion once again about social media? Because it, it has become such a large uh, part of everyday life uh, around uh, the, the, the concept of, of, of politicians and how they can engage and, and support individuals and, and, and do that. But do you, do you think that, that, that the code is adequate enough to, to manage that for, for us all? Or, or is there some need for uh, a revision or, or looking at what we can do to try and... Uh, because every, everything instantly happens uh, from, from the social media side of things. Uh, and someone can react to something or someone can put something on uh, and, it, and it gives an impression or it gives a, 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 a potential uh, for it to be taken the wrong way or, or misconstrued or and I think that's a challenge I, as you as you have already yeah, identified. I, I don't think the code is adequate. The code was drafted before social media was current. Um, there is guidance. The Standards Commission uh, have issued guidance which is helpful. Um, but you're right it's the immediacy of it. Um, and another factor is, again, as I've mentioned before, context. Um, a councillor may something which appears pretty rude in social media. It may be respons in response to a torrent of abuse from another um, source. Now, it's not necessarily right, but the context is relevant to um, how you assess it. Um, so that's, that, that, that is a challenge. I don't think the code currently deals with it properly. And some individuals have been targeted in some respect uh, in, because of what they may have said at a committee or what they may have uh, uh, made a, a comment about in a press release. Uh, and then they, 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 they can have a, a torrent of information coming. And that can be positive or negative, depending on what stance they've taken. Uh, and I think that must be quite difficult to manage uh, when you're... When, if, if you are deciding whether someone has breached the code or there's a complaint process going forward uh, with relation to that. I agree. Um, and thankfully, my, my judgment on it isn't the final word. It does go to an independent panel, which has three people on it, who will make a judgment, and the full circumstances will be outlined there. Um, uh, yeah, it's difficult. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. Graham. Yeah, um, we we had the ombudsman uh, before us, in fact, uh, a couple of times, and uh, they made the same point um, that they they want the ability to launch their own investigations and not have to just wait for complaints, take their own initiative on things. Now, when you get a complaint, you you just have to deal with that in a very narrow sense. So, for example, if we're talking about planning, and somebody says that councillor knows that applicant and didn't declare it. The extent of the relationship between the, the two, you, you cannot investigate. For instance, there might be financial um, links. But, but, so you, you're quite, it seems to me you're quite restricted 
in that sense. Do you think you should, you know, have the ability to, when you're doing an investigation, go off in different directions? Convener, I'd like to answer that in two ways. First of all, the, the example which Mr Simpson's given um, is a live one, um, and not for the first time. Um, so I do endeavour to investigate the extent of the relationship, the contact, whatever it is. Um, and I, my decision will be based on my assessment of that. And that is one of the things which may come out differently at a public hearing, because in those circumstances, um, the, the councillor may put more effort into explaining the situation um, or, or somebody else might give evidence which I'm not expecting about the, the level of the contact. That, that happens. Um, so we, we do do our best, um, and it is an important issue. Um, the one report which I made to the Standards Commission which was not which did not go to a hearing, involved circumstances where, in the course of investigating one thing, I uncovered a failure to um, register an interest. Um, and I reported on that. And the Standards Commission decided not to investigate it for various reasons, one of which was that it wasn't in the original complaint. Another was that, that the impact had been effectively zero, in their view that it hadn't really changed anything. Um, I have said this before, I have no wish to have a, a power, um, it's too late for me anyway, but um, I, if I were continuing, I would not wish to have the, the remit to go looking for things beyond, well, I, I, beyond the scope I'm not, of the I'm not suggesting. I'm not suggesting for a moment you do witch hunts, mm -hmm. That's, that would be crazy, but in the course of a, a dealing with a complaint uh, and other things crop up, Mention them, and as I say, in one case, I reported on it as a breach. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's us come to the end of, of our questions. So I would thank both yourself, Commissioner, and Ian for attending today's session. As a number of members have said, uh, this is Bill Thompson's final session with the committee. And on behalf of the committee, I would want to wish you the very best for the future and thank you for the service that you have given. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. That now concludes the public part of today's meeting, and I move the meeting into private.